so we all know that uh, the origins of greek comedy and tragedy uh, in a drama can be traced to the elaborate greek worship rituals that were uh, enacted in the name of dionysus god of fertility and wine so over time uh, these dramatic ceremonies began to include other gods and human heroes well uh, a fifth century master playwrights like sophocles euripides and aeschylus uh, uh, produced tragedies that focused on humanity's struggle with good and evil in contrast uh, then uh, so this is basically when you look at the drama you know what it exactly means like it's a story which is enacted on stage for a live audience and uh, uh, as I already told you, this is a word which comes from the Greek word gran, which means to do. And then, uh, well, uh, this I think we've already discussed the earliest known plays, which were written, uh, written around the 5th century BC. And uh, then uh, we uh, also know the dramatic structure. I discussed it in the first uh, session itself, where it has the, you know, it's kind of an um, inverted uh, curve where you know you have the exposition the starting uh, the intro and then we have uh, the rising action then the climax and the falling action then the resolution and then the denouement or the end thing which comes in right then uh, conflict we as as we all know it's all about i mean i'm just giving you a, a brief overview of the elements of drama right so now before that, I also want to tell you something about forms of drama. So before moving on to, uh, or maybe after the elements, I'd like to take it up. So when you look into the elements of drama, you have a, a conflict, which is again, you know, it's a kind of a struggle. Most of the plays have this, so oh, the entire story is woven around this kind of a conflict. So then we have a tragedy. Uh, now, this is where... Uh, when the play ends in an un on an unhappy note. And then uh, uh, most classic Greek tragedies deal with serious universal themes such as right and wrong, justice and injustice. And um, then uh, life and death. So these tragedies pit human limitations against the larger forces of destiny. Now, uh, coming to the tragedy, the protagonist of most classical tra tragedies is a tragic hero. This hero is noble and in many ways admirable, has a tragic flaw, a personal failing that leads to a tragic end. Now coming to the comedy is again, which uh, it's just the uh, uh, contrast of the tragedy where it ends happily. Okay, and the plot usually centers on a romantic conflict. Well, uh, the main characters in a comedy could be anyone. Uh, could be no, uh, a noble, uh, somebody from the noble family or the townspeople or the ordinary citizens and the servants and so on. And um, comic complications always occur before the conflict is resolved. In most cases, the play ends with a uh, wedding, right? So, So I also would like to talk a bit about the forms of drama. So now there are more, four main forms of drama. Now they are comedy, tragedy, tragic comedy, and melodrama. Well, comedy, as we all know, just now we've discussed, where you know it is um, a, a kind of uh, having a cheerful ending and a satirical in its tone. And mostly it aims to make the audience laugh. Then tragedy is something... Uh, uh, which presents a serious and exalted style, a style, the sorrowful or terrible events faced by a heroic individual. Then tragic comedy, the classical drama, um, now which drew a sharp line between tragedy and comedy. And however, tragic comedy is a literary genre that combines features of both tragic and comic forms. Now, it's a belief that since the world always laughs and cries at the same time, similarly, tragedy and comedy can be presented side by side as they represent life itself. And uh, another aspect of this is it can be a uh, serious and a sorrowful, but will have a happy ending, or it may be serious with uh, some elements of humor emerging throughout the play. Okay, then coming to melodrama is again a kind of a drama in which everything is an exaggeration of an overstatement. 
Now, usually themes depicted in melodrama are simple without any unpredictable plot twists. Many stereotypes are created in melodramas. Now, uh, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, the participant here, Mr. Nikhil, uh, what's your name? Yes, ma'am, Nikhil. Yeah, Nikhil, is, is this your first session, first class? Yes, ma'am. Okay, haven't you attended the previous uh, five uh, sessions of uh, conducted on Sundays? Actually, I don't uh, message huh. for academy. Uh -huh. Okay, late, you didn't get late. a message from the university, you mean to say? Yes, ma'am. I, uh -huh. I get message late. Okay. A and computer uh, classes also at this time. Oh. That's why I don't attend these classes, ma'am. Okay, but then you're sure, no, it is fifth semester literature, English literature, drama. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you're sure, right? No, yes, because I'm seeing you for the first time on the screen. So that's how I had a doubt. So, but then have you revised at least? Have you started your revision at least once? I, I, no. read, uh, I read properly, ma'am. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, book also reading. Ah, uh, yeah, that is very important. See, in the book, it has been simplified for you people to read the summary, read those question and answers. And then also, um, it's given in, I mean, in a very simple language and a detailed version of that is given in the book. Okay. And yes, uh, yeah, you get books from the university itself. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So this is basically today's just a revision. So I may not go into an in-depth uh, uh, kind of a teaching. So just an overview I'm giving. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Right. You'll be able to follow, no? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, we have a, a comedy of humors. It's again a dramatic variety, most closely related with the English playwright Ben Johnson from the late uh, 16th century. And... Uh, uh, well, it ori originates from uh, the Latin word called humor, meaning liquid. And this term is used in the medieval and renaissance medical theory and the human body held a balance of four liquids or humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile and black bile. So when properly balanced, these humors were thought to be uh, give the individual a healthy mind in a healthy body. Okay, by the way, are you able to follow when I'm explaining, Ma? Yes, ma'am, I will follow you. Ah, try to. Okay, I'll try to be very slow and very clear. In okay, case if you still have any doubt, you can ask me. Okay? Okay, ma'am. Right. Now coming to the next part of it is forms of drama. Well, um, under... Okay, one second. So, okay, just an overview of this. So, drama is a genre where performance is a significant aspect. The term drama comes from the Greek word meaning action. Drama is polyphonic in nature. Early English drama were dramatized versions of biblical events. So, well, of course, early in the olden days, I mean, in the old, in, during old English period and so on, uh, dramas were actually... Uh, you know, the dramatized version of biblical events. Why? Because they had to preach people. So how do they preach instead of, you know, uh, orally, they would, con uh, you know, kind of uh, conduct some plays and so on. And in, in a way, they would teach them uh, uh, or convey kind of a, a morals and ethics of the messages of the Bible. So in miracle and morality plays, characters often represented moral ideas. There emerged four main forms of drama. That, that's how we just discussed comedy, tragedy, tragic comedy, and melodrama. So during the Elizabethan period, playwrights followed the classical norms of drama, considered the golden age of drama. Now, during the 17th century, the Puritan rule banned theater. And uh, Puritan, that was the age where, you know, people did not let perform any sorts of plays or any kind of an entertainment. They were totally against it. So restoration of Charles II, I mean, when Charles II came back to his throne, then the theatres were opened. Even the best of restoration comedies lack story and neat plot construction. So the central and innovative contributions of the 19th and 20th century drama 
brought about many experiments. The difference between traditional drama and modern drama is the theme and style. Modern drama tended to focus not on kings and heroes, but instead on ordinary people dealing with everyday problems. So that's the major difference between the modern drama and the or, uh, the tradi uh, the uh, old and other traditional drama. And uh, most of the times, the drama of the earlier times, which revolved around the emotions and ki kind of coming up with something very flowery and in order to attract the audience. But whereas later uh, uh, stages, uh, that was towards 19th and 20th, they've become quite realistic. And they would always showcase the problems which were faced by the uh, common man and so on. Right. Um, then um, also... Uh, the later part of it, they focused mostly on the themes like alienation and disconnection, the after effect of World War I. That was post-World War, so it was quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, a sad and a very pathetic uh, stage it was. And so people wanted to uh, bring out that in the form of plays in order to uh, bring in a sort of an awareness to people. I mean, the kind of uh, uh, what the people have underwent what kind of miseries they have underwent during the war. They just wanted to bring it out. And hence, the plays which have come out during that period had always these themes. Right. So moving on to the next one. Uh, elements of drama. So we all know when you look at the Right. So if you just look at the elements of drama, uh, there are the six Aristotelian elements of drama are uh, plot, character, thought, diction, spectacle and song. Now, Aristotle considered the first two as most important, that is the plot and the character. Now, elements of drama did not develop in England until 10th century. It was only when church made use of the dramatic elements as part of their services in certain rituals and festivals that these elements were taken into consideration. Now, within a short period of time, to create the desired effect, various elements were constructed effectively, such as uh, the ones which I have already mentioned. So, we all know what exactly the plot is. It means the arrangement of the events in a story. Uh, including the sequence in which they are told. And uh, the focus of the plot depends on the progression of the events. And then, uh, now plots can vary from simple structure to complex interwoven structures referred to as subplot. <clears throat> Another thing is <clears throat> character. Character is the next important element of drama. Now, it's uh, characters are persons like men and women that are seen around us, but sometimes weird, strange, and supernatural types of characters are also found. Now, plot and characters are inseparable part because they, when one reads dramas for their plots in order to find out what follows simultaneously, the reader is eager to discover the fate of the characters. Right. Now coming to another one, um, the uh, you talk about the uh, characters. Uh, they can be classif classified as major, minor, static, dynamic, flat, and round. So, major character is an important figure at the center of the play's action and meaning. So as you all know about the protagonist, okay? Now supporting the major character are one or more secondary or minor characters whose function is partly to illuminate the major characters. And uh, coming to the minor characters, they are uh, often inert or unchanging. I mean, they never change actually. They remain uh, essentially the same throughout the play. Now, whereas dynamic characters on the other hand, exhibit some kind of change of attitude, 
of purpose, of behavior, and so on. Now, there are flat characters which reveal only a single dimension. So, when you talk about the flat character, that is, um, they reveal only a single dimension and their behavior and speech are predictable. And uh, round characters are more individualized, reveal more than one aspect of their human nature and are not predictable in behavior or speech. Now, coming to the next uh, element is action. It's difficult to separate drama from performance because during the stage performance of a play, drama brings life experiences realistically to the audience. When one is reading a novel, the reader's uh, attention and imagination depends upon the story in the book. Now, the story is slowly unfolded while reading, whereas the dramatist does not tell the story. Instead, the audience comprehends or understands the story as the characters interact and live out their experiences on stage. So, drama is therefore presented in dialogue or monologue. Here, dialogue is when two people are involved in conversation, whereas monologue is a single person's speech. Right. Now, dialogue is again another uh, aspect of the characters where the term dialogue is basically conversation between people in literary work. And, uh, and it basically reveals the nature of the character. Sometimes, depending on the kind of language, the character uses and also gives information about the character's relationship with the person spoken or of the person not present when the conversation takes place. Now, there are two types of dialogues in drama. That is, inner dialogue, outer dialogue. Inner dialogue is the characters speak to themselves and reveal their personalities. Um, then again, now, to use this in the dialogue, usually the writers employ techniques such as dramatic monologue or soliloquy. Whereas, uh, outer dialogue, that is, it is, uh, you, you can, some people can, you know, can uh, figure it out, uh, where it's a simple conversation between two or more characters and their interaction with each other. Then, um, soliloquy, as I told you, this is an inner dialogue, is between two speakers. Whereas monologue is spoken by a single person. There's a difference between a monologue and a soliloquy. Now, soliloquy is actually used to express a character's state of mind. A soliloquy represents a character's thoughts so the audience can know what he or she is thinking at a given moment. Then, um, dramatic illusion. I'd like to talk a bit about the dramatic illusion is what it's a kind of a false sketch of a deceptive impression or a false appearance. Literally speaking, an illusion is, is something that is false and not factual. It tricks the human brain into thinking an unreal into a real. In other words, it's meant to mislead the perception of the character and deceive his senses. Then we also have a Uh, staging or stage directions where, you know, uh, the dramatist, uh, uh, this drama which is actually uh, distinct from other literature because it is performed in front of an audience by actors to tell a story along with the use of a set, lighting, music and costumes. Now, stage directions in earlier drama were written in the form of an outline of the scenery of the uh, drama and also broad directions to the actors. In the Greek dramas, the chorus took care of the functions of the stage direction. So chorus is what it's a, uh, a in, a, in many of the uh, plays of cho chorus expressed to the audience uh, what the main characters could not say, such as their hidden fears or secrets. The chorus consists of uh, between 12 to 50 players who variously danced, sang and spoke their lines in unison and sometimes were masks. They wore masks. So thus Greek chorus communicated in song form about individual heroes, gods and goddesses. Then, uh, okay, let us move on to the structure of plays. Uh, it can be one act play. It can be a five act play. Then uh, 
it uh, then you we also have a, so one act plays are like you know uh, uh, plays short and which has to take place within a short period of time and uh, the one act play has a beginning middle and end the exposition the conflict the climax and the denouement now all these stages are clearly demarcated in longer plays but they tend to overlap in a one act play then uh, we have five act plays now the drama is divided into five parts in a five act play which are referred as a dramatic arc where i think i've already discussed this exposition rising action climax falling action and denouement now again uh, we have uh, uh, the impact of plays on the audience uh, which can make the play a powerful medium of communication and interaction what kind of an impact does it leave on audience so catharsis so catharsis is a feeling of pity and fear felt by the audience for the inevitable downfall of the protagonist that is when people start liking the hero and then suddenly you see there is a flaw of a tragic flaw and then the there's a downfall of this protagonist then people start feeling very you know sad for him so it's like pity and fear so that uh, generates uh, pity and uh, fear the play which generates and that kind of a feeling which is uh, called as catharsis and the audience while watching a tragic play experiences catharsis in other words the audience fears that in a similar situation they may face sufferings like the tragic hero now peripatia is very effective in drama particularly in a tragedy it's a sudden or unexpected reversal of circumstances or situation which is also known as the turning point the place in which the tragic protagonist fortune changes from good to bad now this is actually a device in drama which is meant to surprise the audience as well as shocking as it results in pity and fear now anagnorisis here anagnorisis is when a character learns something he had been previously ignorant of this is normally distinguished from peripatia and anagnorisis or discovery if a play uh, for example in oedipus the protagonist curses the person who had committed a heinous crime without realizing that he is the person responsible for making the gods angry and causing plague as punishment so in the play when the shepherd tiresias points out to him that he is person who has committed incest and murder then he is totally devastated as he discovers that he himself is the true perpetrator so this is the example of anagnorisis now coming to tragic hero so uh, the term hero is derived from the greek and uh, that means a person who faces adversity or demonstrates uh, demonstrates courage in the face of danger so when he can face it or confront downfall he is recognized as a tragic hero or a protagonist now let me just throw a bit light on films a few terms and definitions a uh, film we all know it's a story or event recorded by a camera as a set of moving images and shown in a cinema or a television it's also called as a movie or motion picture it's a visual art coming to storyboard what is a storyboard it's a visual outline of a film or animation it's an important part of the pre production process and consists of a series of images that show everything that's going to happen in the finished piece then camera we all know which is uh, involved in a film it's an optical instrument then retake is a take of a single continuous recorded performance long shot uh, is also referred to as full shot or a wide shot which uh, typically shows the entire object or human figure zoom is again zooming in filmmaking that is um 
a, a close up to wide shot during a shot giving a cinematographic degree of freedom then uh, editing as we all know it's a that is fine tuning whatever has been uh, uh, the film has been shot right so moving on to the next uh, unit that is renaissance to restoration One second, I'm trying to share a screen now. So the next unit, which goes like this, uh, it's about the Renaissance and restoration and uh, uh, how the drama had uh, developed during this period of Renaissance and restoration and uh, what was the social literary influences on the playwrights of the period and the forms of drama of the period and the major writers of this period. So we all know that Renaissance, it was a passionate period of European culture, artistic, political and economic rebirth following the Middle Ages. The term Renaissance means rebirth. Okay, It's generally described as taking place from the 14th century to the 17th century. And it promoted the rediscovery of classical philosophy, literature and art. So we actually know this, uh, it, uh, it originated in Italy. The birth of Renaissance. It was actually a cultural movement that initially began in Florence, Italy, but later spread throughout Europe. So these were some of the techniques like, you know, their perspective changed and uh, about the art and architecture also like uh, uh, and uh, giving a kind of a 3D images, a depth of 3D into images and then shading and new oil paints, study of human anatomy. Then uh, we can also look into the development in, in terms of architecture.
right. So it was actually kind of a new learning during Renaissance. Scholars of the classics called humanists revived the knowledge of the Greek language and discovered and disseminated a great, num great number of Greek manuscripts and added considerably to the number of Roman authors and works which had been known during the Middle Ages. And uh, again, coming to the new world in 1492, Christopher Columbus acting on the persisting and widespread belief in the old Greek idea that the world is a globe, sailed west to uh, find a new commercial route to the east, only to be frustrated by the unexpected barrier of a new continent. The succeeding explorations of this continent and its native population signed its settlement by Europeans gave new materials to the literary imagination. Now, in terms of literature, the two greatest books which appeared in England during this period are undoubtedly Erasmus Praise of Folly and uh, Moray's uh, Utopia, the famous kingdom of nowhere. Both were written in Latin. Right. Then we also know about uh, the painter and the sculptor, Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, as I told you, the human anatomy also they were working on. And uh, Uh, then another important aspect is humanism. That was a, a kind of a cultural movement during 14th century, which was called humanism that began to gain momentum in Italy. Well, uh, some of the names would, I would like to mention here during this period was uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, geniuses, you know, who have made a mark in various fields of learning and uh, uh, new areas of discovery and inventions during the Renaissance. Leonardo da Vinci, Desiderius Erasmus, René Descartes, Galileo, Nicolas Copernicus, Thomas Hobbes, Geoffrey Chaucer, then Giotto, and Dante. Well, when we uh, let, next move on to the Renaissance drama, it's a term that embraces Elizabethan drama. Now, Jacobian drama, which was, uh, um, and the plays written during the reign of Charles I. So, English Renaissance drama is also called Elizabethan drama. <clears throat> now, the famous, uh, some important English Renaissance playwriters, I mean, playwrights are William Shakespeare, Ben Johnson, Christopher Marlowe, John Lyley, uh, Robert Green, Thomas Decker, John Webster. Out of all these, among these people, uh, William Shakespeare was the greatest Renaissance playwright ever. Now, the, he had written plays, sonnets and poems and were divided into categories such as comedies, histories, tragedies and romances. Now, if you look at the characteristics of Renaissance drama, uh, It was like uh, the Renaissance theater was the rediscovering of the classical drama. The master of revels had control over what could be performed on stage. Female roles were played by young boys since their voices were still feminine. Older women were played by any man. So women were not allowed on the stage at all since they did not want attention diverted from the play or invite lewd behavior by men. Now coming to the restoration period is again uh, by a strong freedom of th thought in a society. Now the drama, if you look at it, the restoration drama, uh, which came in by the crowning of Charles II, which marks the restoration of traditional English monarchical form of government following a short period of rule by a hand 
full of Republican garments. So I think before restoration, uh, the period was actually uh, taken up by Puritanism in England under the government of Cromwell. He, as I told you, that they did not favor dramatic events. So there were fewer and fewer theaters. And uh, then after the coming of Charles II, the drama was reborn. That's how we also have a kind of a significant development after the Restoration Age. Now, the theater, if you talk about the theater, it was one of the most significant aspects of uh, Restoration literature. Uh, that is the return of the theater. So, So the period saw many innovations in theatre, including the important new genre called Restoration Comedy. So in this we have, uh, in this unit, we have Macbeth by William Shakespeare. So this is a, a play where you can just read it. And this is in fact a tragic play uh, 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 and it's a, a kind of a serious story which ends with the death of a main character. So it's a five-act play. I think we have also have a Hindi movie which is a an adaptation of Shakespeare's Macbeth, Makbul. This is a movie and uh, uh, some of the most celebrated language in Macbeth can be found in the speeches of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, both of whom begin the play in fast moving pace eloquently and but ends the play with more halting and vague equivocal language. So a quick uh, uh, sum, uh, summing up of Shakespeare. Uh, uh, he has been a uh, the canon of English literature, in fact. So his deft use of language and imagery make his plays very effective. And uh, his concern with human emotions has a universal appeal. So we find many of his plays adopted in various languages world over. His themes are relevant even to this day. Then... Uh, uh, also, we have The Rivals uh, by Richard Brinsley Sheridan. And uh, that was during the restoration period. So these are the two plays for this unit. That is, one is The Rivals, or the Richard Br Brinsley's uh, Sheridan's, and the other one is Macbeth by Shakespeare. And then in the next unit, uh, we have uh, Modern English Drama. So in which we also have a Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw and then uh, A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen. So modern drama, it's actually an era of British literature when England dominated by the elite class tried to receive and establish its own identity from the mid 19th century. So if you look at the major writers of this modern era, era one second, I'd like to
so it uh, if you just talk about the modern english drama which refers to the plays written in the 19th and 20th century the characteristics if you look at it uh realism is the most significant and outstanding quality of modern english drama where they were all uh, you know the dramatists of the uh, years of this 20th century were uh, uh of the earlier 20th century were interested in naturalism and it was their endeavor to deal with real problems of life in a realistic technique to their plays once again so and uh, it was henrik ibsen the norwegian dramatist who popularized realism in modern drama and uh, he dealt with the problems of real life in a realistic manner of his play his example was followed by robertson arthur jones galsworthy and g b shaw in their plays so i think henrik ibsen's doll's house is been uh included in your syllabus no problem play the modern drama has developed uh, uh, and uh, there are many modern dramatists who have written a number of problem plays in our times now they dealt with the problems of marriage justice law administration and strife between between capital and labor in their dramas now they used theater as a means for bringing about reforms in the conditions of society prevailing in their days henry kipson's play a doll's house is a good example of a problem play now the problem play was a new experiment in the form and technique and dispensed with the conventional devices and expedience of theater now modern drama is essentially a drama of ideas rather than action the stage is used by dramatists to give expression to certain ideas which they want to spread in society so mod modern drama dealing with the problems of life has become far more intelligent than ever it was in the history of drama before the present age with the treatment of actual life the drama became more and more a drama of ideas sometimes veiled in the many in the main action sometimes didactically act for so basically uh, the earlier dramatists of the 20th century were realists at the core but the passage of time brought a new trend in modern drama romanticism which had been very clear to elizabethan dramatists found its way in modern drama and it was mainly due to sir j m barrie's effort that the new wave of romanticism swept over modern drama for some years of the 20th century now again poetic plays t s eliot uh who gave importance to poetic plays of the uh, modern drama and uh, stephen phillips john drinkwater yeats were from those who wrote poetic plays history and biographical plays another trend visible in the modern english drama is the direction of using history and biography for dramatic technique now g b shaw's uh, caesar and cleopatra are historical plays of great importance and john drink waters abraham lincoln and uh, mary stuart are also historical plays and uh, there is a revival of the comedy of manners in modern dramatic literature the drama after the second uh, has not exhibited a love for comedy and the social conditions of the period after the war is not very favorable for the development of the artificial comedy of the restoration age that was after the second world war then uh, impressionism it actually shows the effects of things and uh, events on the mind of the artist and the attempt of the artist to express his expressions expressionism it's again an another important feature of modern drama it marks an extreme reaction against naturalism it's a movement that tries to express the feelings and emotions of the people rather than objects and events 
So if you talk about the major writers of this modern drama, G.B. Shaw, Henry Gibson, J.M. Singe, then in which we have uh, Bernard Shaw's Pyg Pygmalion. And uh, okay, then it talks all about the uh, Pygmalion and the play and then about the writer, George Bernard Shaw. So a bit about this title Pygmalion, it's a title which is based on the legend of famous Greek sculptor named Pygmalion drawn from Ovid's famous poem Metamorphosis. According to the story, he fails to find goodness in women in general. So he carves out a statue of a woman and names her Galatia. Galatia and he falls in love with his own creation and marries Galatia. So this is how the play is divided into five acts. And then uh, written in 1912. And it contains the story of the Greek sculptor Pygmalion and his lover Galatia as a backdrop. Now, Henry Higgins. Okay, so this is something which revolves around, uh, around this uh, uh, st uh, play. Or the uh, Greek, uh, I mean, it's kind of the backdrop being this Greek sculptor Pygmalion and his lover Galatia is, a, you know, based on this, uh, he has brought out this play the story in fact and uh, Here uh, we look into a bit about uh, Henry Ibsen, the writer of the play Dollhouse, A Doll's House. And uh, so it's basically translated as a dollhouse. It's a Norwegian, uh, it's a three act play in prose by Henry Ibsen. So basically, what is the significance of this title? It's a, the word doll means a woman who has no mind or will of her own. A doll's house, therefore, means a house in which there lives such a woman. The word doll in the play is applicable to Nora. She is a doll because during the eight years that she has spent as Helmer's marriage partner, she has always been a passive and subservient kind of wife to him. And uh, this title is very appropriate because it signifies the kind of a life that Nora has led for eight years in her husband's home. So her exit from her husband's home is turning point in her life. Her exit can prove to be a new starting point for Nora. So then... Uh, So I think with this, uh, we finish these three units, the first, second and third. And uh, probably in the next session, we will try to revise the next two units. I'm, uh, I'm sure you understood whatever we've discussed in the session today. Yes, Nikhil? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So maybe next class when you come up, uh, I would request you to go through the literature, the textbook for the next two uh, blocks also and then come back so that it will be easy for us to discuss in the class rather than me presenting the complete lesson once again. If I can get some queries from you where I can explain it, right? Now, okay. if you, yeah, if you read it only then you'll be able to kind of, you know, get some doubts and, you know, you can clarify it in the class. Okay. 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 Thank you. Next, next class, yeah. ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Next, I think uh, you'll get an information. Maybe next Sunday. It's only on Sundays we have sessions from three to four. 
Okay, ma'am. Yeah, if, just three to four. We have next Sunday again, and okay. I think you'll get your message also. I think so. Probably from the university, they'll be messaging you. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. You can leave the session, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Welcome.